disclaimer. We bring a change to the regularly scheduled broadcast of the Sweet Chinwag Podcast. Now, on with the show. It is time to tune up the band and have a nice day, for it is another episode of the Sweet Chinwag Podcast. I am Sam, alongside Reardon and Dan, as we chronicle this journey through the wacky world of professional wrestling. Good afternoon, chaps. How are you doing the, uh, today? Not doing, not 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 doing badly. Not doing badly. Yeah, it's all right. Just, it's all just, right. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. You know, it's all right. Dealing with it. Apples and pear. I don't know. What am I doing? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're off to a... Don't offend my heritage, thank you. <laughs> we're off to a flying start already. Alrighty then. As ever, we give you this podcast thanks to those lovely people over at SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, forever pending other platforms. You Always know how we do. <laughs> be pending. Ah, Alrighty, so this week has been a very interesting week but for more on this week it's time to visit dan for this week's wrestling news dun 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 down wrestling news dan you just went that very quickly this this week's um <laughs> uh, you caught me off guard for a second <laughs> so that's record time i've done that intro isn't it potentially <laughs> uh yeah so uh, we'll probably change it up a little bit, uh, and I think the big thing that we'll be looking at is just the kind of, at least what we believe to be the scheduled card for WrestleMania coming up. Yes, finally. I think they, have they have they finally got their act together and finally no, uh, I, kind of well, stuck I a card believe, together? I believe, I believe we have a, a full card now. Oh gosh, oh gosh. <laughs> Uh, so, so we'll go we'll go over nights one and two of Mania, and then nights one and two of NXT's Stand and Deliver, hosted uh, by Adam special. Ant. I wish <laughs> Prince Charming. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, that would be that would be fascinating. Uh, so for Mania Night One, we are going to be having Sasha Banks versus Bianca Belair. Uh, just say so these are not in order of the card; these are just matches that we know. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre with the Hurt Business banned from ringside. Oh, we that's have... the fun for the hill. <laughs> I know. <laughs> They'll appear anyway. They'll find a way. <laughs> uh, we will be having The Miz with John Morrison versus Bad Bunny accompanied by Damian Priest. <laughs> we will have Seth Rollins versus Cesaro. We will have the Raw Tag Title match. Uh, and then we will also have Braun Strowman versus Shane McMahon. Is that in a McMahon train match? Choo choo. <laughs> the, the fucking train sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that, Reardon? I don't think I want to. So, so you know uh, Braun does that usual shtick of when he runs around the ring knocking into people? The production crew thought it'd be great to add tra- choo-choo trade sound cause effects. Because he, he, ca- he calls the move the Strowman Express. So oh, they just put in, they just pumped in a train noise. I hate everyone. I don't blame you. We do not deserve to exist as a species, that's it. <laughs> that bad, huh? That's just a terrible idea. Dad, you might want to move on to night two very quickly. <laughs> Or the rest of the card, I should yeah, say. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it, it's just it's just to say, really, I think uh, the the matches to really watch from that are going to be uh, Banks versus Belair. Oh, yeah, I think absolutely. we all expect that to be pretty fantastic, a real high-quality match. Um, I guess my Dark Horse one, I, I don't know if I if would exactly call it that, but Rollins v Cesaro, it's a non-title match, um, and the build has been pretty quick. But it's, I, hmm. it's two solid workers, so I feel like they could really put on something really great. It's been quick, but it hasn't been too bad, if you ask me. And I feel like this really... I hope this justifies Cesaro re-signing this match. Yeah. <laughs> I really... I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that this match is 
the the what was it the the shits or as or as Joseph Montecilio says, this match fucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really want it. To, I really want it to be that case. Um, yeah. But I would not. I would not be surprised. I would like to see it if Banks Bel Air becomes the main event of Night One. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I. I, I think it should be. Absolutely. Uh, but going on to night two, uh, we now know that Roman versus Edge versus Daniel Bryan is now going to be officially be a triple threat match. Uh, match. We have Oscar versus Rhea Ripley, uh, Orton versus Fiend, presumably joined by Alexa Bliss. Uh, we have uh, IC title Big E versus Apollo Crews, and then Sami Zayn versus Kevin Owens. Because we haven't seen that match. Actually, no, I, I joke about that. But I joke, but I, I'm, I'm quite excited for that match, actually. <laughs> because as as Kevin Owens said in Ring of Honor, we're destined to do this forever. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, now, that's not a bad night, too, if you ask me. Um, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at, at it and I'm, I'm seeing, you know, a good two, three matches that are definitely worth it. Um, that triple I'd, I'd say the only the only one that I maybe have any kind of reservation about might be Orton versus Fiend. Yes, because now it's got to live up to it's got to live up to last year. It's got to live up to Reardon's favorite match of twenty twenty. I mean, everything has to live up to that match. Because, <laughs> like, I, the thing is, I think that Orton would be a fantastic candidate for a Firefly Funhouse match. Yes. Oh yeah. If he isn't spitting more... out black licorice, then yes. Yeah, there, there's there's more than enough material there to to do something like that. Um, and like again, we have Oscar versus Re Ripley, where the build has been pretty quick and pretty dirty. Yeah, it's um... kind of just been a bit of a Bosch job. <laughs> but at the same time, though, we know the ability that both of them have. Yeah. If they're given the time, um that they can put on something fantastic mm. Mm. if given the time i would have guaranteed that this probably would have been one of the more hotly anticipated matches but given yeah. what we got given the cards that we were all dealt with i'm still pretty excited for this match this might be the sleeper hit of, of both nights of wrestlemania i i really hope that it becomes that sleeper hit well yeah that's that's kind of how i feel in regards to um Big E versus apollo Mm. I think that could yeah. really be a sleeper match that will catch people off guard. Yeah, I, I do agree there. Oh, just a lot yeah. of... I'm very... I'm cautiously excited, as I guess a lot yeah. of people should be about this year's WrestleMania. I, I mean, if I was in the crowd, I'd be cautiously excited as well. Well, that's well, that's the thing. I know a lot of people are kind of coming to this saying, you know, it could potentially be the worst WrestleMania in a couple years. <laughs> as long as it's uh, not bad, let, not worse than thirty-two, then we should be good. Yeah, and like let, let, let's be let's be real of it. For for a lot of the build of it, it's been pretty bad. <laughs> we have a full card, what less than twenty days away, which has never really yeah. happened before. Like you usually have a card that's probably set like a month, two months, maybe before WrestleMania, not days before WrestleMania. Well, it's Everything just things like you know. Just... Everyone was looking at, say, Banks versus Belair as the marquee as the marquee match, mm. and then next thing you know, you know, we're looking at it, and both of them are going into Mania basically on losing streaks. Yeah. Damn. Uh, but going over to NXT for their stand liver uh, night one, we will have Io Shirai versus Raquel Gonzalez. Very much uh, excited for that. Yeah. Uh, the tag title match will be the battle of the acronyms, as I'm calling it. <laughs> uh, MSK versus Grizzled Young Veterans versus Legado del Fantasma. I am very excited for that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Very that, that could again that could be an absolute burn and it just goes to show the the strength that they have in uh the nxt tag division <laughs> that is true uh we will have the six man gauntlet match i don't have all the participants written down here but it's pretty <laughs> much it, it it's a like a a six man gauntlet match to be decided and then the winner will go on to face johnny gargano on night two. Ooh. 
So realistically, who whoever they pick, and you know they've got people like Bronson Reed, uh, Dexter Loomis, Kushida, uh, all in there, among others. But I know he lost this week, but for me, my logic would dictate Kushida wins, and then Kushida wins the North American Championship. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a pretty that's a pretty natural course. I mean, because that man gave us one of the funniest moments of 2021 so far when he was behind when he was behind the, the Gargano in his group. I refuse to call <laughs> them by their name because it's so silly. Uh, no, but that, that that's just like uh, stacked with. Uh, I mean, I guess what you term NXT mid card, but they're all they're all up a mid card at, at, at lowest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then just finally, uh, it will be Volta versus Tommaso Ciampa for the NXT UK title. <laughs> no, that's going to be... So um, who's dying? Uh, I believe Tommaso Ciampa. <laughs> I see. <laughs> oh, man, I'm so excited for this one. This is like, just, just give it to me. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be an absolute. Uh, it's going to be an absolute burner. I'm trying to think. They probably have met before in like PWG or something. I believe they may have. Because I, I, I'm almost certain I remember them meeting in a tag match once. Yes, yes. I'm almost. I'm almost sure of yeah. that. God, this is me. I, I completely blanked on PWG. I'm so sorry, Super Dragon. <laughs> I, I have it in my head that I'm I'm like ninety nine percent sure that they did. It just isn't sticking in my head specifically what event it was. Uh, mm. But going on to night two though, we then have Finn Balor versus Karrion Cross for the NXT title. We have the yeah. uh, Adam Cole versus Kyle O'Reilly unsanctioned match. Yes. Uh, Gargano versus the Gauntlet winner and then the Cruiserweight title unification match. Oh, I said about that one the better. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a ladder match now because Shawn Michaels decided to come out and just, you know what, I'll make this better. I'll just grab a ladder and throw it to them. Get it? Get the reference? It's a ladder! Look, Get it's it. a unification match! I had one of those in 1994! <laughs> it has to be done, apparently. <laughs> it's, it's just WWE beating you over the head with a rubber mallet just shouting, do you get it? Do you get it? Say hello to the bad guy! <laughs> <laughs> a razor Ramon sized mallet. Uh... <laughs> hey, look! All I'm saying is, if Santos Escobar was to come out with some razor Ramon inspired gear, I think that would win me over more so for Santos Escobar. I mean, for realistically, Santos Escobar can't lose my support at this point. That is, yeah, that is true. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> oh man, um, but no, I mean, like. Let's just let's just say that there's an into- there's such a breadth of wrestling available over that time span, and that is just WWE. Yeah, there's, you know, I th- I think there's wrestling every single day in the two weeks leading up to Mania. Yeah, we've got from different gosh, companies. I think we've got the collective. I think the collective weekend is happening. Um, uh, yes, yes, I, I believe it is. Because uh, I do know that Blood Bloodsport Six is happening. Uh, yep. Very excited for that. Uh, I'm always just very excited for Mania Week because there's always such a great variety of of stuff going on wrestling wise that week. I know AEW is also doing a house show during WrestleMania Week as well. Yeah, um, it's just a shame we're never going to get uh, this year. We're not going to get the 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 match. I think everyone wants to see. It, it, is that it. it's Invisible Man versus Invisible Stand two? You know, on look, we can't have everything, unfortunately. <sighs> I know, I know, but still, I feel that there's 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 some unfinished business between that rivalry between the Invisible Man and his evil brother. Look, soon, soon we will <laughs> get it. It will happen. I just want Bryce Remsburg to be the ref again because God, did he do an amazing Only job? Only Bryce Remsburg can ref that match. Do you think anyone have, else has bad boy vision? Exactly. No. <laughs> exactly. Only Bryce Remsburg has that. <laughs> Reardon, I hope you know what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, no, and I never will. Oh, okay. I need <laughs> I'm to. I'm almost show you... certain we've sent you that before. I'm surely. pretty sure we've sent you that match. I don't know if you have. 
Okay, well, we'll do it after. We'll do it after the recording. Absolutely, we will. <laughs> Oh, uh, just gosh. quickly to go over um, other promotions quickly. Uh, fairly sh- fairly strong showing for NXT UK uh, this week. Um, mm. I like the Ilya Dragon of Sam Gradwell match. Yeah, that was great. I mean, no DQ just kind of so- fits Ilya Dragon off just kind of perfectly. <laughs> Absolutely does it. No, great match from the pair of them. Uh, going over to AEW, it was really nice seeing Laredo Kid back with the Lucha Brothers uh, mm. for the sake of the event. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, it's kind of crazy at this point that the Lucha Brothers haven't held the tag titles. It, that's just that. That's just insane. I mean, considering how much how much you know love we've had for the Lucha Bros, we talked about it quite a bit in the Lucha Underground episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's crazy how that's not the case uh but that should be i'm hoping that that's rectified very soon <laughs> yeah that should that should be happening soon and i'm sure very soon the two of them will be getting world title opportunities if not at the very least tnt title matches mm. um just a quick note from myself to say that uh, ty conti is fantastically improved in such a short span of time, yeah, it's 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 insane just how quick, how fast and quick she has improved in the ring. Um, I, I, you know, I get mad Kurt Angle rookie year vibes from her at this rate, dude. That's the thing, though, is that she she's really taken she's really taken the step up in, in a short amount of time and is becoming one of the you know, one of the focus points for uh, their women's division. Yeah. And I think it only really bolsters where they're going from there. I think this is the thing that a lot of people have been saying, is that they invested a lot of stock in younger wrestlers who maybe had less experience. And I think, unfortunately, a thing that AEW still might have is that they are still kind of lacking that experienced leader. Yeah. Yeah. But with with the way that they've got people coming along, um, I think they're building themselves a solid base for the future. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's not it's it's very exciting to see, for sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, experience leader wise, I still I still maintain that I feel like Eddie Kingston's probably the perfect role for that. <laughs> Oh yeah, of course. I mean, you know, we're, if we're if we're thinking about, you know, people that they could uh, uh, bring in for their women's division, uh, may maybe a little bit harder uh, to say specifically. I mean, I will of course always espouse the the greatness of Lufisto. Yes, yes. Uh, there. In my mind, there's very few people that could be better. Um, you know, I wouldn't mind if they did say uh, wrapped up some stuff with, with the NWA, the NWA Molina among their ranks. Mm. I mean, um, I, who could be good for that? I, do we know? Am I, I don't know if I've heard anything, but is Con still that awesome Con still contracted with AEW? So I believe that she's. I don't know that she is currently because mm. I feel like she would be nigh on perfect outside. Of yeah, Gale she would Kim. be. She would be uh, fantastic there. Yeah. Oh, God, I was about to say someone there. I forgot who I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I know you mentioned Melina because there's still, you know, that yeah. working relationship with NWA. Um, I'm trying to think. So we had, I mean, Lou Fisto would be great. Uh, Melina would be great. Awesome Con would be great. Gail Kim would be amazing. Um, I mean, it would be, it would be, I mean, it would be of Tony Card to go, you know what, I'll throw money at Trish Stratus. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I mean, Christian's there, so. Which I'm very excited. More Canadians. To, I'm very excited to see his uh, match, uh, his debut AEW match against Frankie Kazarian. Nice. Yeah, dude, that's one, that's one for, that's one for the TNA marks among us. It is nice to re- that they, that they acknowledge the history. That's a nice refreshing thing to see from a major company. 
Because I know with what, WWE... What, it's like acknowledging a... another company. <laughs> exactly. Because yeah. it's a fleeting comment in a WWE backstage promo, but they may, they, 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 they really, really doubled down on that promo between Christian and uh, and Kazarian. So I'm, I'm excited to see that match for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then uh, just finally, I want to go over and just show some love for Ring of Honor after their 19th anniversary show. Hell um, yeah! And, and just to say to people, if you if you aren't checking in on Ring of Honor, please do. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we I was saying this back when uh, the Pure Tournament came around. They were refilming after uh, they felt say they they could do it after uh, in or in light of COVID. Mm. Um, but no, absolutely fan, absolutely fantastic show. Uh, the foundation going from strength to strength, yeah. uh, as we've said between ourselves. Uh, Jonathan Gresham is. At this rate, an easy contender for the MVP of 2021. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, nice to know, see. Fact... <laughs> yeah. Nice to see that Dan Housen's been uh, has been approved by CM Punk for using the go to sleep. He got approved by Kenta as well. Yep. I'm so happy about that. <laughs> he did get approved by Kenta as well. Um. But no, the foundation picking up both the TV and the tag titles. Absolutely fantastic. Jay Lethal being in the main event against Roosh. Oh, just, you know what? If dream booking, if I was to ever be a booker, well, it's never going to happen. For me right now, would, could you imagine a, a stable war between the foundation and the hurt business? Absolute excellence. Yeah. Come on, come on. Like Jay Lethal and Gresham versus Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin. Sign me the hell up to that. Yeah, and then like we and then we we look into it coming from coming off that show, and we now have a new faction in Ring of Honor. Yep. Uh, with Brody King, Tony Deppen, Homicide, and Chris Dickinson. Yeah. And so, for anyone that doesn't already know who he is, Tony Deppen is one of the hottest talents on the independent scene. Yes, uh, and Chris Dickinson is one of the most frightening men on the independent scene right yeah. now. <laughs> he's Bars yeah. Rootin is if 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 Bars Rootin ate Bars Rootin. Uh we have we have Brody King um who's been absolutely killing it on the independent scene and yeah. up doing stuff with New Japan Strong uh, mm-hmm. and he's doing absolutely fantastic work over there. Mm. Uh, and then of course Ring of Honor legend really homicide. Yeah. One of the free icons of Ring of Honor and it's it's always nice to see Homicide, uh, but it's great to see him back <laughs> home, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, it's just, it's. And I think the thing is, as well, is that you, something I love about it is that then it's like they're, they're coming in and making the statement against uh, La Faction Ingobernable. Mm. Um, so then that sets up, you know, this group, well, a continuation of uh, Brody King's feud with lfi yeah but also setting up this new stable that can have matches with lfi uh, a new stable that can have matches with members of the foundation it's a great and year for stables hasn't it been <laughs> so far it's a great year for stables it's a it's an amazing year for ring of honor because then continuing uh with that uh new head of ring of honor's women's division maria canellis yes Congratulations. Uh, Good pick up, I think. Yeah, uh, especially given the history that she has with the company as well. So, no, great choice uh, in that regard. Announcing the new Ring of Honor Women's Championship to replace the Women of Honor title. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then there'll be a tournament held to determine the winner. Uh, and, like I said, I'm very happy about this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see where they go of it because they have made a distinct point about the the title of the tournament being over to you know all comers. Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see who they get in. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if the forbidden doors open as well at Ring of Honor. <laughs> well, that's the this... thing. I I I genuinely think it is. Uh, because it'll very. I mean, I I'm I because if that's the case, God. Man, I I can already list off a whole bunch of women I want to see in that tournament. 
Uh, Maki Ito being one of them, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, like, <laughs> look, Maki Ito should be in everything. Exactly. <laughs> we, we've said this. Yes. Um, yeah, no, but it, it just kind of remains to be seen who, who they will bring in, because obviously mm. they were bringing quite a few um, Joshi talents before COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and also picking up some of the more prominent ones on the independent scene as well. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like we could get a good kind of melding of talent, and also, like I mean, again, I'm casting myself back to the pure tournament, um, and the kind of range of people that they had in there, and the range of people they decided to use for it. Yes, that really helped uh, bring a lot of it together. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think a lot of people were expecting, say, picks like uh, Matt Seidel or PJ Black. Yeah. But even still, they they integrated very easily uh, into it. <laughs> they did, and then some. So yeah, just please check out uh, check out Ring of Honor, and if you do get the chance as well, do check out New Japan Strong because mm. um, it's worth saying as well. Um, NWA uh, had their first edition of Power off the back for the attack. Yeah. Uh, at least for myself, not a massive amount to write home about. I'm still very much learning NWA power. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, uh, Fred Rosser, for, formerly Darren Young of WWE, uh, got a 1A number one contender match for the uh, NWA TV title. Mm-hmm. Uh, so interested in that. Interested to see how that's going to go. After such so long, you know, not recording and given the kind of um, a lot of talent leaving for a new past uh, pastures, it I for me personally, it was just nice to see NWA back after either, after an uncertain time as well uh, last year of them. Yeah, absolutely. wondering if they would ever come back, but it was no, it was great to it was great to just see it. I'm hoping like, it will they'll pick the pace up as they did when they started. Yeah, I mean, power. like I feel I feel like right now they're just kind of in the mode of staying stable. Exactly. Uh, they've got a nice little program running between Nick Aldis and Chris Adonis, formerly Chris Masters, mm. uh, which is like not a. It's not something to write home about, but it's something that will keep them stable. It can keep them going. It's two solid people. They don't have to worry about, you know, losing any stock out of it. Yeah, because I think a lot of people would have complained if they had just rehashed Nick Aldis and Tim Storm again. Yeah. So to just have something to kind of just get everything off the ground with with with, with Aldis and, and Chris Adonis, I don't mind it. Mm. I'm not incredibly fussed, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of a nice comfortable place to get stuff going back and then they can slowly start building stuff up and mm. getting a little bit more risky and crazy with it absolutely i mean again part of that as well is uh people speculating whether or not uh thunder rosa will start to dedicate more of her time towards aew yes yeah this is this is going to be the very interesting thing to see over the next I, I imagine a couple of months. Um, well, yeah, and then obviously NWA have uh, brought in people like Camille uh, to hopefully start to fill that role. <laughs> will she talk? We shall find <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, we will find out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. With that, though, we are done with the news. Excellent. Mm. Excellent. Okay, so a very special recommendation corner this week. Um, if you did not hear the news or see the news on our socials, the Sweet Chinwag is now a part of Project Dits. This is really freaking cool. So we were, I mean, for all intents and purposes, we were approached by Dits a couple of weeks ago to, uh, to you know, wonder, uh, just to kind of chat and wonder whether we wanted to be a part of his uh, of his network and pretty much kind of a very nice conversation and a no-brainer later and now we're part of uh, of that network. So... I guess the thing we got to say is that nothing really at all is changing, except we're now going to be having be part of a brand new podcast feed to to a much and kind of be broadcast to a much wider audience, as well as having, I guess, Ditz's capabilities of doing a, a deep fakes. Because if you've seen his gif of um, his face on Rebecca Black singing Friday, then you know how haunted and cursed yeah. that image is. 
<laughs> but no, honestly, I, I don't know about you chaps, but I'm very, I am very happy to be a part of Project Dits and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, as I said, you know, we're, we're still the same old people. We're still doing the same old thing in our own same way. Nothing else is changing about production. We're just appearing in one other place a little bit more often. The same amateur produ- production, just to a wider audience. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Alrighty, with that, it is time to move on to the main portion of this episode. The passion of the Foley. <laughs> Yeah, the life and times of one Mick Foley. Oh boy. Okay. Before we get on and I run down his life and career, my first question to the pair of you is this. What do you think makes Mick Foley so special in the grand scheme of professional wrestling? If you could make an argument that he is like we call it the passion of the foley as a joke happy easter by the way everyone <laughs> this will this will technically be our easter special theming. <laughs> our theming but in all honesty off the top of my head i can't think of another person who has suffered more for wrestling than mick foley yeah Outside of Terry Funk, yeah, yeah, was, it's it's literally just Terry Funk and him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is pretty true. <laughs> um, I I think he is um, you know, what with him and and Terry Funk, he did not invent hardcore wrestling. Mm. I would never give him that, but he is. But he definitely, you could make an argument that he perfected it. Mm. And you could, and you could certainly say that if not for Mick Foley, hardcore wrestling as a mainstream part of wrestling just frankly wouldn't exist the same way it does. For bad or for, for better or for worse, I'd say in that regard, because, you know, we've yeah. got to deal with backyard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perhaps, yes. Not ev- unfortunately, every backyard wrestler who thinks he's the next Mick Foley, <laughs> which, which now that you now that you put it when you put it that way, you could argue that that no wrestler has harmed the general public <laughs> more than Mick Foley. If we're thinking it that way, <laughs> a ridi- a ridiculous table spot does not a Mick Foley make. Yes, no, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's hard to kind of quantify and qualify what makes Mick Foley um, so kind of special in the wrestling sphere. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I, I, I don't know, again, it's kind of like you have a lot of things and you can't quite explain it. Mm. But I guess the best way I could describe it's gonna sound horrible when I say it. He he perfected the art of just taking punishment in a match. Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. And like, um and so like I said, like you know, a ridicule, a ridiculous bump does not a Mick Foley make. I think another thing that's also super important about it is that he knew when to do stuff for effect. Mm. Mm. Because, like, I know, obviously, we talk about Mick Foley as, like, a super crazy hardcore wrestler, but, like, a lot of it is that we always pick out that one moment from a match Mm -hmm. that always just sticks in our head. Yeah. And I I think that is a a very small thing. I also think that he is just generally quite a relatable person for a lot of people. Because mm. mm. in in an industry full of like absolute Adonises, seeing a man like Mick Foley, I guess maybe for some people feels a little bit comforting. Yeah, I feel for me, it's like here's a man through sheer sheer bloody mindedness and perseverance was like i am i know i am worthy of the main event spot i now need to show people that i am worthy of the main event spot 
Is that yeah. if that means that I put myself in harm's way? Yeah, damn right, I'm going to put myself in harm's way. Yeah, because like, yeah, I think that is one thing. He is a like I don't. He is. He's almost like a a more violent version of of Dusty Rhodes, in all honesty, in terms of build. I mean, and even Dusty Rhodes was violent himself, so that's saying yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dusty Rhodes was not, like... He, a b- very brief aside, but can we just say about how, like, despite it not looking much, how nasty a bionic elbow actually is? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, no, because what was it? Dusty Rhodes ended up doing some pretty hardcore matches, like, towards the end of his career. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, because the, the the only person I can ever really quantify as being similar to Mick Foley in that way, I, like Sam will know what I'm talking about, Rin, you might not. Uh, Sam, you know Jun Kasai. Yes. <laughs> oh, do I know Jun Kasai? Yeah, and it's kind of like he's absolute. You watch it and you kind of think like he's absolutely insane, mm. y- yet something about it is like oddly entrancing. Yes. But again, it's always also that entire kind of, you know, image and mind about himself and how and how he goes about things that make you that kind of pulls you into it. Mm. And yeah, we we should just say anyone who is squeamish, don't watch a Junker side match. And indeed, indeed. And we're talking about all this as aside from the fact that I believe as well that Mick Foley's one of the most charismatic men in professional wrestling, as well as one yeah. of as, as well oh, as a absolutely. de facto master of ring psychology. Oh yeah. I mean, as well, it, it, one thing that we can say about it is that I think one of the things that Mick Foley always had to himself is that the man's got fucking personality in spades and buckets. <laughs> he really, really so in, does. In, in amongst all the, it wasn't like in amongst all the crazy, like he only did the crazy bumps. He, he, he could talk. He could get people on side very easily. And like people, I mean, I don't think people forget, but like he pretty easily went toe to toe with some of the best on the mic during the Attitude Era. And he kept up with um, he kept up when he was at WCW too. Absolutely, absolutely. As we're going to get on to right now. So, gentlemen, would you like me to go over the life and career of Mick Foley up until his debut in the WWF? Please. So, okie doke. As always with these things, it's always an amazing part to start at the beginning, or a good start to start at the beginning. (laughs) So, born in June 1965 in Indiana, at two years old, he ended up moving to Long Island, New York. He grew up absolutely loving wrestling and being a high school amateur wrestler as well. During those high school days, Foley would regularly go and take the train to New York City to catch wrestling shows. Of course, one such night in the early 80s saw Foley in the third row of the world-famous Madison Square Garden, watching their very infamous cage match between Jimmy Snooker and Don Morocco, in which Snooker, at the end of the match, losing, climbed to the top of the cage and delivered a jumping big splash to Don Morocco and the mat. A seminal moment in Foley's journey for wrestling. As a matter of fact, I believe that night, or it could have been in a different show at Madison Square Garden, I believe you could actually see Foley in the third row throwing up the Jimmy Snooker, uh, Snooker hand sign uh, during that oh, moment. Wow. Um, so, pretty soon after that, he ended up getting trained by one Dominic Danucci in Pennsylvania whilst he was attending college. <laughs> so during his time in college, he would split between studying and in training to wrestle. <laughs> Which I can imagine is a tough schedule to keep up. Yeah. Probably is. More the power to you, Mick. So he would make his debut in 1983, first working for Danucci's promotion, eventually getting spots as enhancement talent and a jobber in the WWF. Oh, one such tag match during this time as an enhancement talent saw him pitted against the British Bulldogs. He took a clothesline by Dynamite Kid, which uh, broke Foley's jaw, leaving him unable to chew food for several weeks. Which, you know what, being the Dynamite Kid and being Foley as a jobber does not surprise me in any way, shape or form. Oh, God. (laughs) Because if you've heard some of the nightmare stories about Dynamite Kid, you kind of 
kind of you know it's no surprise that that happened and this is only just the start of the laundry list of injuries that foley would sustain in his career <laughs> so during that time after after his enhancement talent phase in the 80s in wwf he pounded the pavements of the indies and through that formed his character of cactus jack a crazed and wild competitor who held no such regard for the health of his opponent or himself This would garner the attention of WCW in 1991, but not before a stint in the infamous UWF run by Herb Abrams. (laughs) Now, if you've seen the Dark Side of the Ring episode, you don't need me to tell you how crazy the UWF was. And just even how, or even more crazy, Herb Abrams was. (laughs) But, oh goodness! I mean, the can one... I just say, right? This is the random side note. Yeah. What is it with like indie promotions and using the initials UWF? <laughs> so many do it. Mm. Literally, because it was I not copyrighted know. by the original Universal Wrestling Federation. Uh... So it was taken. Yeah, but they all just put in words together, and the engine just ends up being UWF all over again. And I'm just like, well, which one is this now? <laughs> it's the Universal. It could be the Urban one. We'll never know. <laughs> just... But. But yeah, there was also this. If you remember as well, if you've seen if you've seen Brian Zane's or Wrestling with Regrets video on UWF, you know that Mick Fo- one of Mick Foley's first merchandise was uh, Cactus Jack cookies. What? <laughs> yeah, Herb Abrams did a line of UWF cookies. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> See, this is what I mean about this like weird subsection of like random promotions. Look, you had WC... They all just had their own weird thing that they just decided to release. You had WWF with the ice cream bars. You had uh, WCW, just at the end tail end of their run, have a brand deal with Chupper Chubs to do those crazy feet dips. But you have UWF with cookies. It just makes sense. No, I have to say the greatest piece of the greatest piece of merchandise that WCW ever put out was the WCW cologne. Yes, the nitro for men. Yes, yes. <laughs> Nothing beats that. Oh God! I think also someone mentioned that uh, uh, one of them. I can't remember which one it was. It might have been WCW or WWF that did hot sauce. Yes, I think it might have been. It might have been WCW. All right, I'm making a note for myself to do weird wrestling <laughs> merch now. <laughs> so we're going to get onto what a manoeuvre, right? And we're going to sell hot sauce via them. <laughs> Dude, if they let no, us no, do no, it. Listen, no, listen, listen. Obviously, if we have to sell like our sauces, it has to be sweet and sour chinwag sauce. Oh, wait. Oh, Weirden, you've come up. You've come up with the absolute best choice. You're Literally. You're an entrepreneur, man. Sell that <laughs> shit. Sell that shit in a water maneuver right there. Look, all I'm saying is, right, eventually they'll listen to my plan to sell onesies, right? Oh, God. I'm just saying, right? Is they haven't not... returned my emails. For the last time, Dan, we're not going to sell onesies, because if we do, we're going to have to do it checkerboard style like Sam will want, and I don't no, want No, no, that. no, it's zebra print, of course, to keeping in with the Shawn Michaels aesthetic. Mm, you see? Mm, mm, <laughs> I'm watching you. <laughs> okay, so that's a, that's a no on the uh, refillable drinks bottles, then? Ah, oh, shame, we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk after, we'll talk after the podcast. <laughs> okay. All righty right. then. Talking of, uh, going straight to WCW, his debut would see him attack Sting, immediately sending him to the main event scene at that time. Uh, in a losing effort, as, uh, I think, no, it was, a, it was a debut. I think Sting just finished his match and then out came Cactus Jack and he did his whole shtick of just beating the everlast- everlasting crap out of him outside of the ring, not inside. Uh, (laughs) Soon after that, feuds with Van Hammer and Abdullah the Butcher led to Cactus Jack having a match with Sting in a non-title Falls Count Anywhere match at Beach Bash 92. Sting was the successful man in this match, but both men gave it their absolute all. If you've gone back to watch this match... this this match is like... It's pretty much... It's like 10 minutes of people just beating the hell out of each other. Yeah, (laughs) it is. 
it is a very different side to Sting at that time, for sure. Mm. Uh, but no, a, a really hard hitting match. And for the longest time, Foley has quoted, has been quoted saying that this was one of his best matches. Um, wow. Actually, up there with one of his, if if not his absolute favorite. Uh, but we'll get to what he considers his absolute favorite very soon. Th- this time, he would mold his character, become more maniacal. And it was at this time in WCW he would coin his famous catchphrase for Cactus Jack: "Bang bang." bang this bang. immediately sent him to the uh, to the moon and became an absolute fan favorite. So coming from a heel to an absolute fan favorite, just for going bang bang. <laughs> I mean, it's just great. It's, it's so simple, so it's just effective. It's the way the world works. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't make the rules. Yeah. And of course, if we're going to talk about WCW, his time in WCW, we've got to talk about probably his most infamous rivalry. So 1993 saw a vicious feud with Big Van Vader, which indeed saw a lot of infamous moments happen. Uh, I'm going to go over them. A power bomb spot to the exposed concrete floor yep. caused Foley a concussion and to lose feeling in his left foot. Oh, damn, this was all to build to the not so great amnesia storyline that Cactus Jack had when he became a sea captain. If you remember, <laughs> I mean, uh, to be yes. fair, I mean, to be fair, if you do that, then maybe, maybe, like at least they, at least the build was right. <laughs> Yeah, because there's there's the one spot where he's on the apron and then like Vader hits him off and you can see him just try and bump to the outside. You see his head bounce off the concrete. It's oh, it's grim. it is painful viewing. It is real grim. Uh, but yeah, no, just I'm... to say we 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 never said that this was all sunshine and roses. <laughs> exactly. This is more wilting flowers and barbed wire. Um, mm. <laughs> so the, uh, Halloween Havoc 93 saw the two square off once more, ending with Jack being electrocuted via stun gun by Harley Race to give uh, Vader the win. This then in early 94, oh, we would see one of the most gruesome moments, I would dare say, in wrestling history. It's up there. (laughs) Munich, Germany. In a house show tour for WCW, Vader Irish whips Cactus Jack to the ropes to set up his infamous hangman spot where Jack uh, or Foley would throw himself over the ropes and then kind of tangle himself, kind of almost looking like he was tangled by the neck. uh, Yeah, and he'd kind of be holding onto it with his hands to keep it off, to keep it off his throat. So he executed it just how he usually does it. But this night, the ropes had been drawn so tight that it was actually choking him and he couldn't free himself. So with just the amount of of all the force that he could possibly muster, Foley ripped himself from the ropes, unfortunately causing deep cuts to the back of his ears. Now, accounts to this are very sketchy. Uh, as to what had happened, because we're not entirely sure if it had just done it, it had been done by itself, or what had happened dur- after that had happened. Vader throws Jack back into the ring, but he grabbed him by the side of his head and unfortunately grabbed him by the ears, and his right ear fell off. Or I, or he's. Uh... Well... <laughs> Yeah. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Unfortunately, there at this time, Foley had to make a decision to either get his ear repaired or to go win the tag team titles at Slamboree a few weeks later. The madman that he is, the mad lad, and we love you, folk, Mick. He chose to win the titles with Kevin Sullivan and to this day has never had his ear <laughs> repaired. It's just... <laughs> it's just one of those things that just like adds to the mystique of it absolutely because like also like you're there and you're like all right so either i get my ear fixed or i win the tag titles (laughs) and unfortunately this was the only title he had won in wcw yeah w i mean i'm trying to think because wcw at that time wasn't it hadn't got crazy yet no 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 we would it would be it would take a couple more years and a couple more i guess because uh, I'm trying to think, who would who would have been the big two at that time? It probably would have been Sting and Flair. Yeah, it probably would have been Sting and Flair. Yeah, 
Um, so this would actually cause this this whole incident would see him butt heads with Eric Bischoff because Mick wanted to write the injury into the feud with Vader, um, but Bischoff was really reluctant that Foley could actually pull it off well, which mm. is crazy when you think about it. It's crazy to think about when the guy who's had his ear ripped off comes to you and say, look, I think we could do something with this. And you say, mm, I'm not sure you could pull it off, though. <laughs> you ripped off the man's ear. Like the man the man was there and experienced it firsthand. I think he knows how to handle this situation because apparently he handled it by winning the tag titles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. But this... you, you'd think you would yeah. think. Oh, you'd... Honestly, real talk. I Honestly, real talk. I think that was just like. That was just him excuse like, listen, I can't I can't go I ripped your ear off and I'm still haunted by that and I can't I can't right now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I wonder if we could ever get Eric Bischoff to explain his uh, his reasoning behind that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Like, I, come on. One day like, easy, Eric. We will get you on the podcast for absolute sure. <laughs> Uh, no, this moment, though, between Bischoff and Nick would be the catalyst for his decision to leave WCW. Is he really didn't, after that, he really couldn't see much of the future working under him. He kind of thought that he was pretty much on borrowed time. He probably had hit the, the glass ceiling and probably was never going to smash it at that time. His last match in WCW would be a brutal Chicago street fight where he teamed with Max Payne to face the Nasty Boys. Yo, the Max Payne? Unfortunately not. No, <laughs> no, no, no constipated grimacing, unfortunately, from Max Sad. Payne. Sad. I know, right? I know. Misused gimmick there. Damn it. Well, so, I just want to see someone do like a slow motion spot. Give me, give me the John Woo spot. <laughs> yes. Someone needs to release turtle dubs around the ring as well. <laughs> you people want to see it. Book it. Vince? <laughs> No, I think Tony Khan might just be nuts enough to do it. Book it, Tony! <laughs> well, because what was it? Uh, while it wasn't the exact thing, I know Liger did a slow motion spot when he appeared in uh, PWG. <laughs> yes, I remember that vividly. <laughs> oh, PWG, we love you so much. Anyway, uh, after his release from WCW, around from that time, 94 to 96, Foley would call ECW his home pairing in matches against his mentor and friend, Terry Funk. Ah, <laughs> uh, the, the match made in hell, that is Mick Foley and Terry Funk, eh? <laughs> just, just... It's two angry men full, full of <laughs> venom. Men, men... Or, or no, I should, I should say, two incredibly lovely men that are very good at showing themselves at being angry at things. Yes. I think two generally lovely men that just have something inside them that demands <laughs> blood. <laughs> they just like the colour red so much. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. I really Ma- don't know. Ma- Ma- oh, God. All righty. Feuds with Sabu, the Sad Man, and Tommy Dreamer soon followed. But he would also capture the ECW tag team titles twice with Mikey Ripwreck. Hell yeah, Mikey Ripwreck. God damn, the master of the whippersnapper. See, if, if it weren't for Mikey oh, Ripwreck, Mikey Whip Steve right, Austin won't be, wouldn't be as successful as he was. <laughs> uh, again, another random side one, but I just, I just thought about it now. Um, there's been a big movement of people recently um, giving shout outs to uh, Canyon. Yes. And it's just people like just getting clips from Canyon matches, just like I'm glad that um his influence is showing through and then showing like a spot from a recent wrestling show. Who better than Canyon? Ha, oh, no one else, man. Props absolute props to the dude. And I think I think it was a this is again, this is another random side note, but uh, again, as we mentioned, WCW, um I think they were saying like from all the people who were on like the last edition of Nitro. Mm. Like most of them were going and doing like, oh, okay, we'll try and get signed with another company or going out and having drinks and stuff. And I think it was like, I think they said it was Chris Candido just went to like a frat party and no, just that started was, doing... No, that was Canyon as well. That was Canyon, yeah. where he just started, he just went and started doing spots at like this frat party. <laughs> I mean, because look, it was, in, it was in Panama Beach, Florida, right on spring break, 
what better way to celebrate the fact that, oh, unfortunately, you've been let go. But Oh, just to cut loose and just go with the spring breakers to a frat party. <laughs> I applaud it. I applaud it. Shout out Canyon, man. Shout out Canyon, man. Rest in peace, dude. Bless his soul. Um... So yeah, during this time when he was tag team champions with Mikey Ripwreck, he would cut that now famous Kane Dewey promo where he land blasted the ECW fans for wanting to cause harm to his son. Remember, his son Dewey, I think, was a baby at this point. So Yeah, the ECW fans were a different breed entirely. They really, really were. Yeah, there's a reason they were called mutants. There's a reason. <laughs> Uh, and during on later on into the later part of his ECW tenure, he would align himself with the BWO for some of the more funnier moments during his time there. Shout out the BWO. Shout out the BWO. If everyone remembers the strutting session that he had with the BWO before his match with Chris Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> Great match, by the way. If no one's seen that match on yeah. ECW, uh, Mick Foley versus Chris Jericho. Very good one to search out for. Very good one to search out for. Okay, so during his time in ECW, he would also go off to have many tours with IWA Japan. Hell yeah. (laughs) This saw Mick have some of his most violent matches of his entire career. Most of them against, who do you think? Red, and you know the answer. I know the answer, but I'm going to just let people love what people say it. Terry <laughs> Funk! Of course yeah. it was Terry Funk! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, though, his most notable matches in IWA was on one fateful day in 1995. 20th of August, IWA's King of the Deathmatch Tournament saw the most brutal matches ever up until that point. And I dare say some of them even to this day. So, oh, no. They, some of them fully hold up to today's deathmatch standards. Absolutely. If not even actually surpass them. So I'll break you down on Mick Foley's bracket during this tournament. He defeated Terry Gordy in the first round. Second round, he defeated Shoji Nakamaki. And then in the finals, he would meet Terry Funk. In a barbed wire rope, exploding barbed wire boards, and exploding ring time bomb death match. That's a mouthful. Dude, I, I love <laughs> IWA so much. So, if I believe this might have been the same IWA, and I'm glad you really brought this up when we were talking about it last week, Reed, and that I believe Mick Foley came out with a cross. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it was the one where he came, where he came out with the uh, carrying the cross. Uh, on his back. <laughs> yep, there you go. So this final match is violent. If you've seen it, Foley yeah, violence get... one way to put it. And then, I would argue um, the correct term would be borderline sadistic. Yeah, uh, blood, a lot of barbed wire spots, a hell of a lot of C four spots <laughs> as well. Uh, Foley would win this match and the tournament, but both men suffered horrific injuries caused by the barbed wire and with the C4 exploding onto, well, yeah. exploding behind them. So, matter of fact, Foley ended up getting second degree burns on his right arm. And he kept it hidden until he got back home. Yeah, that sounds like the kind of thing he would do. So, that, that, his that's... wife only noticed something was up when she couldn't get the smell of burning. Well, again, accounts vary on who you talk to, but she couldn't either get the smell of burning or chemicals from the C4 out of the air. There was this overwhelming smell of burning or chemicals to which Foley was like, I guess there's something I should tell you, unraveled his arm and immediately was sent to the hospital. (laughs) Now, here's the thing. This man. Here's the thing. Foley only got a $300 uh, payday from this. What? Yeah, that sounds like IWA. He only got paid. They don't have that FMW money. He only got paid $300, Rid. Oh, my God. Oh, what? What? But... 
he has gone on account and did say that, uh, and I'll take a direct quote from him. Looking back, that match in Honjo is probably the performance I'm proudest of. And he still, as he said, he calls it probably one of the seminal moments of his career, that match with Terry Funk. Uh, just to say, contextually, uh, just to help people get an idea of it, uh, I, did, I did the conversion. Uh, $300 then is about $515 now. So he did all that yes. for $500. Oh, like, I, I still can't. I still can't. I can't. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> this man. <laughs> this man. <laughs> exactly. All of that then leads us to 90, late 95, early 96, where he shows up in WWF as the heel mankind and begins mm. his very his very first rivalry against The Undertaker. And and this let's is where ju- gonna... let's just say, right, mankind is one of the best characters created for wrestling. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I feel that Mick Foley really doubled down on the character. I don't think I don't even think Vince really properly conceptualized mankind to be what he ended up becoming. This is I one don't of those... think Vince ever understood what mankind was about. Yeah. To be fair, to be fair, we we we've, we've criticized Vince a lot. But to be fair, mankind is a hell of a concept to try and get your head around. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because mm. he originally was going to come in as Cactus Jack, but Vince put the kibosh on that because he wanted to come in with a brand new kind of character. A demon. He wanted to. He had this idea in his head of kind of like a, a Quasimodo kind of type character that was mm. kind of very socially. Uh, here we go. Socially inept in a sense, and was ugly. And, but was absolutely barbaric and violent in that ring and would end people by choking them out, by putting their putting his hand directly into their mouth and choking yeah. them out. So a little bit of that was Vince. But let's be honest, Foley took the ball and ran with it and made it a hell of a lot better than Vince probably could have ever conceptualized. He gave the character nuance. <laughs> yes. He did, and then some. But this is where we're going to end the life and career recap, because I feel like so I it, now go over some of our best moments and best matches. I feel like we're going to talk a hell of a lot about his time in WWF slash E. Yeah. So let's go over first some of our personal favorite moments. If I want to start off early for Mick Foley... His sit-down interview with Jim Ross in 96, where mm-hmm. they finally acknowledged, you know, Mankind as Mick Foley and acknowledged his kind of career before WWF. It gave the character that nuance and that kind of almost... I think this was the first time that people became a little bit more sympathetic to the character of Mankind. Mm. I think yeah, this... no, I definitely, I definitely think it, I definitely think it did. Um I mean, it, it, it's kind of that difference between having a character who, you know, doesn't talk and is just horrifically violent, but then having that same character that is allowed to talk. Mm. Mm. Great segment if you've never seen it. Like, seriously, it is really, really good. They were really good. I, 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 I can't believe I'm going to say this, but the WWF at that time were really good with those sit-down interview things. They felt like real proper exposés. Like... Oh, yeah. No, they were great. They were really good. I mean, Jim Ross, again, was really good in those in those segments, for sure. So I mean, uh, the hell, well, the ones they did in the early, uh, the mid-2000s were like, you know, with Michael Cole, were yes, pretty good. They were good as well. Really good. But, uh, yeah, uh, Reardon, what is one of your favourite moments of Mick Foley? So many. <laughs> so damn many. This is the problem, Mick. You're far too damn good. Yeah, <laughs> You've had so many good moments. I think due to the nature of his work, he has like I, a, a thousand iconic moments. So you know what? We I'm going to... Not my favourite moment, actually, strangely yeah. enough, but we'll go for the moment... That probably, if if you saw a picture of him in the dictionary... Are you going to say the line? Hmm. Start the damn match. 
enough is enough. <laughs> yep. Yep. Ah, uh, <laughs> just, you know, it's uh, funny. It's the iconic image. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's funny, you know, it's weird looking at that image now, knowing how much taller the cage is now. Yes. Yep. Hell yes. I think that's what kind of makes it funny. Because, like, at that point, it looks like he dies. Oh, 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 heck yeah. Oh, heck yeah. For a moment, that was not planned. I mean, the the first one was definitely planned, but for that moment, whew. Yeah. yeah. The second one is actually very uncomfortable to watch. The oh, second, like the incredibly. First one, yeah, the, the, there's a reason they always go for the first one and not the second one. The yeah. first one is is a, a masterpiece of a masterpiece of wrestling. The second one is 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 frankly uncomfortable to watch. Yeah, it's just. Ugh. I think that what really takes me the 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 one image I always have in my brain of that second moment is that close up on Mick smiling as you see that his tooth has dislodged, went through his lip and up his nose. Yep. Yeah, I think the the thing for, the thing for me is it, it's a thing that you you might not see on the first viewing, but when when he goes through, you can see his body like crumple together yeah uh, because he's obviously going through something solid (laughs) yeah i mean i know this match was eventually going to get brought up so i guess with that with Rita bringing up with one of that as his favorite moments i mean i guess do you want to shall we talk about this match a little bit i mean i feel i feel like it i feel like it's an important part of the mcfoley canon absolutely Mm. so you know king of the ring 1998 this was the second Hell in a Cell match after Taker had faced Shawn Michaels in In Your House Bad Blood in 97. Of course, this rivalry was very, had been very much long in the making, and these two would always cross paths seemingly since Foley had debuted in the WWF. Uh, This match, holy crap, this match. Like, immediately they both start at the top of the cage. And, yeah. and, 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 and this it, match starts at 11 and never leaves it. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. God, yeah. I remember an interview that Mick had, uh, had, had done, I feel like, a few years ago. Might have even been inside the ropes. I, I you know, Correct me if I'm wrong on that one. But I believe he said um, when he got up there, um, he got up there and was there with Undertaker. They had all planned it out. He'd got up there the afternoon prior. Uh, like you know, he got, well got there, not on the top, but looked around the structure as it was down, and go. I tell you what, no, I'll do the spot where I where you can throw me off there. Um, it doesn't look like too much of a fall. I should be all right if I can land. I probably be able to land on that table perfectly. Night of the event comes. They're both up there. The fans are there. They're atop the cell. They're about to go for it. You can hear the 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 nails or like the 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 ties that are keeping the cell structure, the roof of the cell structure up pinging as they're walking across the, the grating of the cell. Hence why they've made yeah. this, the top of the cell so much more sturdier since then, because it yeah. really wasn't built for two people to be at the top. Of it. Yeah. Um, but as soon as they got to the edge and they were about to do it, Foley looks and go, whoa, that's a lot taller than I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> It's just one of those things that it, like it hits you in the moment when you're there, and you're like, "Oh shit, I have to do this now." Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Because so, because humans are very bad at at figuring out the distance of height. Absolutely horrific eyeballs. So Foley goes for it, and the crowd in stunned shock shout, and of course the very famous line from Jim Ross: "As God is my witness, he is broken in half." Yep. Accurate. What? Yep. An incredible yep. moment. Look, we give flack for Kevin Dunn all the time, but dear God, did the camera people get the angle right on that? Oh, they, they got did. every bit of that perfectly. Yep. Yeah. That's just especially absolutely. especially the wide shot. Yeah. The wide shot is so important to that. Yeah, yeah. The I think the photographers on that shot as well. If you've seen some of the still images, got that we were at the right angle as well. Because oh no, because there's there's the one from the photographer who's I think just behind the commentary desk, and it ha- you can see Undertaker at the top of the cell. Yeah, and it is it is a full on like it has an incredibly ominous energy about it. Absolutely, 
absolutely. I remember. I've, I also heard that Foley had said that it took like it felt like it took forever to him for him to actually hit the ground. Um, but as he said, I feel. I think he said once he kind of did that rotation, he felt. I think I'm going to hit the the table. I think I'm pretty safe. I'm going to hit the table. Boom! He hit the table, and pretty <laughs> much after that, he kind of got knocked quite a bit loopy from that. Which I can't yeah, say. I'm that not I'm surprised. surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because the thing you were going to say about the falling things, I don't know if anyone here has ever done, like, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, I was going to say it like, I don't know if anyone's fallen some amount of distance, but that sounds like a really stupid thing to say. If, no, you've, ever, if, you, if you've ever done, like, um, uh, diving or anything, hmm. and, like, you go and do it, and you're like, oh, okay, that's fine, I'll just fall down and then be in the water. But like when you're doing it, even if it's only like two or three seconds, it feels like forever. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Undertaker was very famous in an interview for saying that everything around him went silent. Like he had this tunnel vision as soon as it happened. Everything went silent and he was absolutely sure that he had just killed Mick Foley. Yeah. I'm, I'm not su- again, I'm not surprised. He was probably it's... thinking, oh God, I've killed him. Yeah, yeah, because oh yeah, I can't, I can't imagine what the what the the view from Undertaker's point of view looked like. Because of course they had to re- raise the cell whilst Taker was still on top of the cell. Yeah, the hubbub around it of 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 the officials, referees, EMTs, Terry Funk coming out as well, checking up on him. Um, oh god, that must have been a hell of like a very kind of like lump in your throat oh my dear god what the hell's just happened moment see i think as well though right um because i feel i feel like an important maybe an important part of this might just be the undertaker's character yes mm. but can you imagine being the undertaker and then seeing him stand up and then want to do the next spot yeah 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 no remember if you don't know this fun fact undertaker was coming in this with an injury with an ankle injury i did not know that he was coming yeah. in hurt in this match. <laughs> and so, yeah, he ended up... They ended up... Oh, God, I couldn't imagine what that must have been like. It's going through Taker's mind. He's like, oh, my God, he's actually got... Oh, my God, he's coming back. What the yeah. hell is he doing? <laughs> it's he more like... It's, it's, yeah, it's more like, he's still alive. He's still alive and he wants to continue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, so the second, and so the second fall happened. We've talked about that. Yeah, Take where a... his body crumples like a piece of aluminium foil. Yes, unfortunately, the chair going with him was not supposed to happen as well as the cage, uh, the roof of the cage or cell collapsing. Um, of course, leading to that very famous, infamous moment or shot I, I mentioned. Of yeah. course, Taker comes back to the ring, and a very, a very not as well spoken moment of this is when Terry Funk goes to check up on Foley again. Taker's just going like. I think I can't remember what Funk said to Taker, but they both exchanged words, and that gave Taker the impetus to attack Funk, uh, choke slab him out of his sneakers as well. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the ending of this match saw the thumbtacks being taken out and Foley. Through sheer, I don't know what the hell. I think See, I on... imagine at that point he just genuinely couldn't feel anything. Yeah, and I've so had... took the nerves must have been. Spot. Yeah, nerves must have been. He was probably he was probably just there, like yeah, we'll we'll do the fun tax spot. I can't feel anything in my legs anyway, so we'll we'll just do it. Yeah, this just is just get perfect... it out of the way. If, if there was ever a time to do it, it do it when I literally cannot feel my own body. <laughs> yeah, damn right. So the end of the match happens. He is being absolutely applauded and cheered on by the fans. He goes to the back to receive medical attention. And I think for the one that, for the most human moment we've ever heard Vince say, said to Mick, I love you. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> yeah. I, okay, so I'm going to mention two things real quick. One, the funny thing about that match is that that actually, that match is the invention of Jim Ross, actually. Of the bad guard? Yeah. Yeah. Bad guard. Bad guard that, that is... That is that. So, thank you, Mick Foley, for giving us Jim Ross. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, two, mean, I mean, no, it is fair. That yeah, is fair. and two, I got, a, I got a real question. How in God's name is Mrs. Foley okay with this? She probably wasn't. If you watched Beyond the Mat, I definitely could tell that she probably wasn't okay with that. <laughs> I think at this point, she was just like, look, if I say no, he's going to do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I imagine there was some of that energy behind it because I can't imagine anyone willingly being like, hey, hope you have a great day at work going, falling off a giant structure. Oh, here he, there he goes. Almost dying again. Oh, he, he's doing it. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So the, the, there, we've talked about that match as everyone usually does when it leads up to either Mick Foley, The Undertaker, or talking about the Attitude Era. I know ours probably wasn't the greatest version of talking about that, but I, I mean, again, I feel like it's one of those things where it's almost like, what is there left to say? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Without, why... without, without talking to any of the people involved. Yep. Which is why, let's just get it out of the way relatively quickly. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll go on to my one and uh, I've, I'm going to go the opposite way. Yeah. Because I've got like four or five matches which are brilliant and show Nick Foley at his hardcore best. Mm. But I will talk about a bit of his work that I don't think is underappreciated. It definitely gets spoken about. Yeah. But one of my favorite bits of his time was Commissioner Foley. Oh, yes. Oh. I love and Just I'm... to say, even without the crazy bumps, even without all the, the crazy. Um, you know, like the crazy spots and all of that, just giving him a time to be on the mic and just to let him shine. Yeah. Because he was absolutely amazing as Commissioner Foley. Oh, I... It was I, one of my favorite times uh, Yes, uh, on Raw. Yes, without question. I was, I was, that was right into my kind of first, second year of properly watching uh, WWF. And I loved Commissioner Foley so much. Um... Oh man, I want to list down some of my favorite moments here because I don't. I want to talk about my favorite moment of of or like my absolute favorite moment. But I'll build. Oh, I think up we might have the same one. I build up to that. So his second rivalry in WWF was probably his greatest rival in Triple H or Hunter Hearst Helmsley at this time. But yep. uh, my one of oh god, one of his best damn promos in his time there was the Three Faces of Foley promo. Where Dude Love had interviewed uh, Mick Foley just in the lead up to the to the ma- this hardcore match he was going to have with Triple H, uh, and Mick, and of course Mankind's going. I don't think I'm I don't think I'm ready for this sort of match, but I know someone who is. And Dude Love goes, "Oh, I don't think. Oh, you're thinking what I think you're thinking. I think you know what I think. I think you know what I'm thinking." And yes, we see the debut of Cactus Jack in Madison Square Garden as well. In yeah. a really solid hardcore match at that time. This oh, was it's an amazing match. Oh, yeah. The full match is on YouTube, by the way. Go watch it. It's crazy. Oh, is it? Yeah. The, the, full, the full debut, including the promo package of that, is on YouTube for everyone to see. Nin- uh, September 97, Raw. So good. Um, I'll go. I'll list some other ones that I had noted down as well. The debut of Mr. Socko in 98, when Vince yep. was hospitalized with a broken leg. I thought that was quite funny. The Rock and Sock connection. The Rock, rock and Sock. The rock, can I just... The Rock and Sock connection is just one of those great names that never... Oh, it, it's one of those things that just comes about perfectly. And um, uh, as as we went over back in comedy tag teams. Yeah. Oh, um, man. So... They were just a perfect storm together. You could tell the Mick... And Dwayne were having far too much fun together. If you look at those backstage promos, the "This Is Your Life" uh, segment that they did for The Rock. Um, one of my favorite moments is the is the moment where they where they break up, where Mick's kind of trying to break it to Rock that he's that he's that he's breaking up and he's going to go his own way. But The Rock is talking to someone on a phone, and Mick or Mankind hasn't noticed that he's talking to someone on the phone. So he's so. <laughs> Rock of Mick is replying to Rock as he's having a phone conversation. At the end of it, is going like, "Who the hell are you talking to?" So Mick <laughs> goes, "Look, I know you're going to take this hard, but you're going to make it someday, kid." And then just walks it off. And uh, apparently, like the the next 
like segment we see is Mick Foley with Stevie Richards going, "Man, I think he didn't take that well." <laughs> um, Dude, I absolutely love it so much. Uh, so can I can I jump in with my one for Commissioner Foley? Absolutely. Yeah, so it <clears throat> it's one of my absolute favorite moments of uh, the Commissioner Foley time, uh, where he is also in a promo with The Rock. Uh, I and, know this this was, one is. and this was the rock uh on his uh return as like hollywood star rock mm. uh and so it's just kind of a uh you know a, a normal promo everything's going along and then mick foley hits the rock with the it doesn't matter and then he just goes on a victory lap around the fucking ring. What I love, and the Rock is just in yeah. there, just smiling, and there's just something so earnestly loving about it. It's the, it is the fact that just like the Rock is like he can't, he corpses, and he just can't hold it. Like in. he just, he just, he just knows he's he's been got, yeah. <laughs> and just accepts it, and it's so. It's just so amazing. Oh, so so yeah. That is probably my my absolute favorite moment of Commissioner Foley for sure. Um. Uh, oh man. Before I get onto my favorite moment, a little shout out, and we'll talk about the the match in question, like the final match in question. But his rivalry with Randy Orton in two thousand and three to two thousand and four was absolutely stellar. Dude, so I was gonna say, I think. Probably, it's kind of hard to say. I'd probably put it just behind the IWA match mm. as potentially my favorite Mick Foley match. Yeah, mm. without. Um, mm. But he he does an amazing job in this match, and it, I think an important bit of context is is that this do, this match was meant to serve to put Randy Orton over, and oh by golly, it absolutely did. Um. And yeah, it absolutely achieves that. It, you know, in every in every set in every way, it tries to achieve that. It does it perfectly. It, you know, it, it shows Mick Foley at his, you know, crazy crazy bumping best. Um, but you know, it, it shows him as well as a person who is willing and wants to work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think one one thing about this match is that obviously everyone remembers the iconic spot. I'm sure you'll mention it in a moment, so mm. I'll let you. I'll let you have the honors of that. <laughs> <clears throat> One moment of this, it, it it has a spot that he he used to do quite a lot, and I cannot fathom why he would ever want to do it. <laughs> but I remember he had a recurring spot where he'd get hip tossed into the steel steps. Oh yeah! Every time I watch it, I'm like, oh god, no! <laughs> oh, that spot! Why would that, you that do one... that? That one, especially in that match, is painful. It just isn't. It just doesn't look fun at all. <laughs> it looks horrific. Damn it, Mick! Just save your legs for crying out loud. Uh, I will let you get on to the, the the infamous moment from that match. Yes. Uh. Oh, the uh, the the Bob uh the 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 thumbtack moment with the RKO. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So yeah, this is Backlash two thousand and four. This rivalry had been going on from 2003 when Mick Foley had been gifted uh, the uh, the Hardcore Championship. It's kind of like a memento for being a, a legend. This was at Madison Square Garden. Uh, and then gets attacked by Ric Flair and Randy Orton in the back. Um, and then kicked down the stairs by Orton. This would lead to a long, long old rivalry which culminated at Backlash 2004 in that incredible hardcore match. But yeah... Randy uh, with the fun tax spots, the fun tax in the ring. Randy Orton goes for an RKO. Cactus Jack, I think he as he reprised his character, yeah, takes Randy did. Orton and says, "I'm not taking that," and just proceeds to dump him right onto the fun tax. If you see Randy Orton's face the moment before that, it is like a face of pure fear. Yeah, he <laughs> is. He is scared out of his wits. I've never seen. I, he took a flat back bump as well onto the tag. Yeah, his face afterwards is iconic as well. <laughs> So freaking lootly. No, fantastic rivalry. My a little recommendation: go watch uh, Wrestling Bios. He did uh, a very recent video on the rivalry of of Orton and Foley. Well worth your time to watch that. It's incredible. Yeah, no, but that. But my that, fav- that match is just amazing. <laughs> so good. But my favorite moment, which will lead into one of my favorite as we get into the best matches. My favorite moment is. 
SmackDown 2000, a couple of weeks before the Royal Rumble, Cactus Jack returns to a massive pop as Mick, as Mankind says, I can't be in this match with you anymore, Triple H, but I know someone who can. Takes the mask off, rips the tie and shirt off to reveal the wanted dead shirt of Cactus Jack. I think the way Triple H sells that as well, when they put the close-up on him, the absolute shock and terror on Triple H's face as he realizes, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in danger. I am yeah, in danger. Yeah. That, that is a definite look of, oh, I have messed up so bad. Just, I've never, it's been a long time since I've heard a crowd, especially a SmackDown crowd, be that loud and pop so massively the way that did. I remember getting off of my seat and going, Whoa! I mean, I, at that time, I didn't know who Cactus Jack was, but I was like, I am invested in Cactus Jack. 100%. Hmm. And of course, that leads us nice into a segue into best matches. And of course, man, if I'm going to talk about one of my favourite match, it's got to be that hardcore match from Royal Rumble 2000. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh. such a good match. Such a good match and how this managed to get shown in its entirety on channel four is beyond me because <laughs> that's you see they I just didn't check <laughs> that is where i first saw that match on channel four and it was shortly after i believe it was shortly after the bikini contest where may young decided to take her bikini top off but you know it's a different time in wwf <laughs> look with the good comes the bad <laughs> absolutely I've talked previously, I believe, about this uh, one moment in this match, which really kind of elevates a little bit of my respect for Triple H, is that there was a um, a wooden pallet in the set design of the of Royal Rumble 2000. If you remember, they had like the taxi above, kind of like a oh like yeah, a, like a gritty mm. New York alleyway. Yeah, and there was yeah, a wooden pallet put on the side. Uh, Foley sets that up on the floor and delivers a superplex to Triple H onto the pallet. Unfortunately, the way the pallet had uh, um, snapped and broke under Triple H, one of the bits of wood snapped, went up his calf. No. And he proceeded to have uh, credit to where credit's due to Triple H. A big, uh, unfortunately, kind of, he suffered quite a big cut on there, but he carried on. I, I up until very recently, I'd say about five years ago, I didn't even know that Triple H had that happen to him. That cut. Oh, no, I don't think I ever noticed that in that match. No, because boy, did they go! They go! They went so hard in this match, more so than that match that they had in '97. I mean, this was the time of like Triple H. This was the McMahon Helmsley regime, or the of the, yeah. the, the, the brewing of that um of that uh, uh stable. So it's like. The man's on the top of his game as a massive heat magnet, and core oh, he delivered. He he paid his dues in that match. As I said, give props to where props due to Triple H. He put on an absolute stellar match against Mick and that uh, in that night. One of my favorite, one of my favorite matches, hardcore matches for sure. Uh, but not the absolute favorite, because we'll get to that. So Reardon. What is one of your favourite matches of Mick Foley's in his history in WWE? I, I, I'm not sure if this is a boring match, but I think as a kid, it really made an impression on me. It, it is, it is Edge versus Cactus Jack. Oh, again, uh, absolutely stellar match. I yeah. think the a moment I knew I was watching something special. Is when Edge is the is the is the first moment, the first proper hardcore moment of that match where Edge spears him, yeah, doubles in pain, and everyone's like, "What the hell?" And then Cactus Jack reveals he was wearing barbed wire body armor underneath his damn shirt. Yeah, Dude, I fucking love the body armor gimmick. Yes, I, I, it's I, so I, good. As something which, as a child, I realized. One, you can do that. Two, there is people crazy enough to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, look, Marty McFly invented it. Bret Hart perfected it. Mick Foley yeah. just increased it by 10. <laughs> <laughs> just... 
Yeah, um, the one for, the one for me in that match is when he's doing the man he's doing the mandible claw, but he's got the barbed wire wrapped around his hand. Yeah, I was like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, this I mean, this is the match. Yeah, this is my absolute favorite hardcore match of Mick Foley's. Without yeah, question. I totally understand why it is because it, it's an amazing one, and obviously it has the spot in it. Ooh, yes, which uh, makes different. But um, no, I think one the, I think one of the things that for me made this match so special was. Uh, I guess you kind of him bringing back the the Bob Wire two by four. Yes, yes, uh, and getting that in the match because it kind of like he'd stopped using it and it, he didn't really get a chance to make it a focus in matches. But they they kind of made a big point of like selling up the Bob Wire, mm. which was really appreciated. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this match, <laughs> man. This match. Yeah. Uh, that that spot though. Um, leading up to it, they had been already really violent and barbaric. Like both of them had taken licks and then some. One thing I will say to Edge, and I think he and him, himself has gone on record in saying, "Why the hell did I not wear a shirt in that match?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Can we talk about that? <laughs> well, because I know one. I know one part of that was when they had the big spot. Was that they were both. It's. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was that both of them said that they didn't want to wear the protective stuff. Mm. That they both chose not to do it. Am I Question. Right, am I right Why? in saying, I believe... I don't know. This might have been the match. I might be mistaken in this one. I believe they said that they both had covered themselves in some flame retardant kind of... Um, cream and stuff but mm. during the whole match they were sweating so much that they had just sweated the whole thing out, off yeah i think i did hear about that they did yeah. they did have it like prepared because they're because probably especially mick foley because you he, he probably went to edge yo edge fire hurts we're gonna need some stuff <laughs> well yeah because i i think i think part of that was that it was like i, I think it was edge was worried about was worried about his tights mm. Like if through the course of the match they got ripped or something, yeah, yeah. And then obviously having to take the spot, yeah. Uh, I, I, wasn't it? It was like Edge. Even even he, uh, I think this might have been his inside the ropes interview. It was like, what? I'm going face first into fire. Is this a wise decision? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, yeah, having to spear someone. In putting your face through flames, all I could say is thank God he didn't like. Thank God he didn't have like a beard at that time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank goodness he still had his eyebrows intact. That's that's yeah. all I'm saying. It's that's like, true. Actually, both... it's a miracle that like they they were hurt, but it, it's a miracle that that both of them were okay after that. Yeah, Massive. both of them sold it spectacularly. By I, I imagine they probably didn't even need this, to sell see, it the way they did. Spear through fire. There's nothing to sell. I was going to say, I think it's the look of <laughs> how sheer do, shock how do you and terror. How no-sell fire? <laughs> exactly. The, I think this look of sheer shock and terror of Edge, his wide-eyed look with blood streaming down his face, and you could tell he's like, he, adrenaline must have been hitting hit, hit him hard because he was shaking like a leaf after Dude, that. Dude, because I can be there and say the one thing that he sold amazingly was the mandible claw in that match. <laughs> oh, God. So did Lita, actually, for that matter That's as well. That's true as well, actually. <laughs> But I think that busted so to be, her to be as fair, well. Um, <clears throat> we we I've been going through this with some people because WWE did their list of like the fifty greatest women in WWE. Hmm. Um, and and this is just to say, like, a Lita was obviously fantastic. That's not up for debate. Yes, but uh, her and Edge at that time worked so well together. Oh yeah. And and this this match is one of the great examples of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, no, look, come on, great match. Probably, as I said, my favorite hardcore match of Mick Foley's with that question. Um, and it's another one of those matches that's again, what is else is there need to uh, need to be said about it? Um, no, absolutely amazing. Yeah, I think that I think that genuinely is the case. It's kind of just like the match. Spe- the match very much speaks for itself. Yeah. Yeah, man. All right, I have a few more listed actually in terms of my yeah. I've matches got here. I've got two more. Um, I I'll quickly run down a couple that I I I've already mentioned. So the the Boiler Room Brawl from SummerSlam '96 against the Undertaker. Fantastic choice. Great, mm-hmm. cho- a great match. 
Uh, Mankind versus Triple H in a cage match a year later at SummerSlam '97. This would see back him... the boiler room. Yes, yes, it was in SmackDown one and two. Bring back the boiler room. <laughs> uh, no, the cage match from SummerSlam '97. Great. Yep. Foley did his own iconic top top of the cage spot, which was great. And this would see him turn into Dude Love soon after. Uh, Mankind versus The Rock in halftime heat in 1999. The No Arena fault count anywhere match. Yep. I like this for how balls to the wall silly it was. Uh, yeah, and the, I mean, in, and the in visual... a sense, it was kind of like um, it, was, it was like a, a less a less ridiculous version of, I guess, like the stadium stampede. Yes, mm. but absolutely. for its time, but for its time, it was completely different. Absolutely, I, the the finish is absolutely silly as well. If not for the for the the, <laughs> the really funny camera angle, so to <laughs> pin the rock, uh, mankind used a forklift, but in in a in just a piece of again a little piece of inspiration from Kevin Dunn, he decided because this was a pre tape to have the camera on the forklift lowering and you can see the rock's grimace going, no, no, it's <laughs> <laughs> getting pinned with the forklift. <laughs> oh, no, uh, quite a good match. Definitely worth going back and taking your time. To oh, watch so, that so worth going back and watching. Um, so actually, I was going to say, I'll leave it to uh, Dan and Reardon to go over some of your ones that you've had listed and thinking about. So we'll yeah. start with we'll start with Dan. As you said, you had a couple of uh, ones that you had noted. Dan, what were? Uh, those? Yeah. So the the first side one I was going to mention is just because you came close to mentioning it. I was going to mention uh, Cactus Jack versus Triple H from No Way Out 2000. Ah, yes, the the, the, uh, so, the so called match. the so called retirement match of, of yeah. Mick Foley. <laughs> yeah, but like we we all know that. At that time, Mick had Terry Funk syndrome. Yeah, <laughs> forever. Um, uh, but no, seeing as you mentioned uh, Mankind and Rock, I have to mention Rumble '99. Oh, the I Quit uh, match, yeah. And let's just be here and say this is one of, if you're of a certain inclination, this is one of the most uncomfortable matches to watch. It was supposed it's... to be three times, Dwayne. <laughs> Just like ridiculous. this is literally the the premise of this match is man gets beaten to an inch of his life while his kids are watching. Like it is, it is, it is absolutely <laughs> horrific. But for that exact reason, it is like wrestling gold. <laughs> it's crazy how that works, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, but it's like what it's like what I said at the start is that he he is a master of the match where he just takes punishment oh gosh yeah because the 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 thing is is that like at at the time the rock was even though he wasn't like you know everyone's favorite he was like the celebrity face oh gosh Mm. yeah and so like even though he wasn't like you know necessarily a pure baby face Mm. It was like everyone was behind him but then everything in that match just made you turn and just think no he is a monster <laughs> yeah and it, it it was so good at getting you to feel that sympathy for mankind now correct me if i'm wrong was this when the rock was wearing that sweatsuit that he would wear i believe you know, so because he was wearing that like that shirt and the trousers because i know because like, the funny story about that was i believe the rock had surgery and just kind of wanted to cover it up for a couple of months. Yeah. Um, I think it was the chest surgery because, of course, he didn't want to end up suffering. Well, unfortunately, a lot of Samoans end up suffering. It's um, it's it's a it's a bad case of man boobs. I'm just going to say, it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it, but Rock, Rock, Rock wanted to have a little bit of surgery to kind of like reduce the the, the size of, of, of his pecs. You know, mm. fair play to fair play where it's gone. I mean, look yeah. at him now. He's I'm, an absolute, he's an absolute brick like, shithouse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But no, but the, like the, the, this match is just the Rock going in and just absolutely decimating mankind. Mm. But it, it it all it all ties itself together into the bigger purpose of like having you look at mankind and really getting you into that feeling of like I want to believe. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. And then of of course, as 
as the infamous as the story infamously goes of one of the biggest goofs ever of the time where <laughs> WCW Tony Schiavone uh decide to mention the fact that mankind's going to win the WWF title uh which ends up making a bunch of people turn off from WCW Monday Nitro to go and watch Raw and they never got those ratings back up ever again yeah, um, but like, again, but even even outside of that context, I think for anyone who was watching WWE at that time, it, it made you want him to win. Absolutely, yeah. Because S- you just had you just looked at this man just take the punishment, and you're like, no, mm. I, I want him to do this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, such 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 a moment in a match that has now kind of, I guess, been forever mortalized, immortalized thanks to Beyond the Mat. Yeah. Mm. Um, great film, if no one's seen that. That is a very great... That no, is I believe it, it, in the UK it is on Netflix right yes, now. Yes, it is. I believe it is. It is. Fun fact about that, I never, I watched that the other day, didn't realise that there was a cameo appearance by Christopher Daniels when he was working as an enhancement talent in the WWF. Wow. Oh. I forget Dan- that he was there as an enhancement, yeah. Yeah, with hair. Yeah, I know, but like Christopher <laughs> Daniels with hair is, is just cursed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Reardon, do you have any more kind of like Mick Foley matches in your lexicon of the of the wrestling mind that that spring to mind as favourites? Spring to mind as favourites? I will say his match that helped... Turn the tide of the Monday Night Wars, winning the uh, was it the world or was it the the it, w- w- it would have been the WWF, WWF title. title yeah yeah the WWF title yeah on a Raw as well which... yeah on on a Raw so I mean I love that match for a whole multitude of reasons the context of it of course you had the corporation going up against uh, DX um, in in yeah. mankind's side. Um, that one of the very famous moments was the crowd absolutely going nuts with Steve Austin coming down with a chair and absolutely twatting everyone. Uh, as he is wont to do. As, as, I don't know as what it is case. about whenever Steve Austin came down to the ring of a chair, there was just something different about his walk. It really... <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he held that like he, like was... he straight up no. just starts like putting full motion yeah. into his shoulders yeah. with it. I yeah. feel like... he, holds, he holds a chair like I imagine King Arthur holds Excalibur. I feel like he's ne- like he's trash talking and neck wig and neck movements was on par with D'Lo Brown when he had a chair in oh, hand. Oh, straight up, yeah. Yeah. it was. Yeah, 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 God damn, son of a bitch! Boy. It was also it was also the fact that half the time when he did it, he never ran to the ring. He he insisted on walking, yes. which. <laughs> We really appreciate just power walking. <laughs> just walks aggressively towards someone. <laughs> <laughs> no. Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh no! Great moment, and as I said, that was the pivotal moment for WWF because after that, pretty much WCW struggled to recapture the ratings that they had once had, uh, beating WWF at that time. I believe that would have been the Nitro as well. The thing, if the finger poke of doom happened. I'm correct. Oh please God. do, yeah. please do yeah, correct believe, me if I'm wrong, but I, have, I believe, if memory serves me Yeah, correct, I believe that was the same night. Mankind winning the Dojo title, finger poke of doom. <laughs> that is something, isn't it? Uh, I tell you what, what I'm going to end it on a really silly note, and, I, I, and I'm going to say this. I enjoyed the uh, Rock and Sock versus Evolution handicap match at WrestleMania 20. Um... Yeah, I liked that match. It was pr- it was a pretty damn solid match from all involved. And again, it further um, expanded the story of Orton versus Foley, which would culminate a month later at Backlash. Um, Foley being an MSG, getting back with The Rock, who had been gone for a year at that point. He had just, I believe, made Walking Tall. So he was kind of doing that as a way of kind of promoting that film. By the way, Walking Tall, great film. I enjoyed it. Matter of fact, I believe Charlotte Flair is in the remake of Walking Tall. So I'm looking forward to seeing they did that. A remake? They're doing a remake of Walking Tall with Charlotte oh. Flair play, playing the role of uh, uh playing the role of Chris Vaughn slash Buford Pusser. I'm okay. guessing they're gonna name her differently, obviously, but Probably. But no, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to a female walking tall with Charlotte Flair. 
<laughs> I think I think I've rendered read in a like you're speechless. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no, uh, but no, great match. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Fun little fact about this one. Batista uh, clotheslined Mick in the larynx. And so he suffered oh, from God. a raspy voice for the for, for about a few weeks afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, Batista. <laughs> oh, we love you, Batista. We do. We do. Uh, but yeah, I think with that, we're going to culminate and end this episode all on the passion of Foley. I guess the last question we could say is... Just how important is Mick, do you think, to the world of wrestling? Because I think he's a hugely important pillar in in professional wrestling. Well, I, I think for myself, as you know, as a self professed deathmatch ghoul, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> yeah. hard. It's kind of hard to overstate it. Yeah, because like obviously we know what the Attitude Era was like, and everything was really was just really crazy anyway. Yeah. yeah, and that you know, hardcore matches were far more prominent. Mm-hmm. But I feel like you know, when you're talking about, I guess if you want to say like a hardcore Hall of Fame, not including Mick Foley is sacrilege almost. Yeah, yeah. And and I I, I think it's entirely fair to say that he is, he is arguably one of, if not the, hardcore icon of the United States. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd, I'd go as far as saying that. <laughs> and and yeah, it's just like f- for me, it's incredibly amazing because it's like I had the chance to see these kinds of matches. It got me exposed to a whole new, different vein of wrestling. Mm. Um, but but also, I think it's super important to talk about his character work. Yeah, mm. which I think has influenced characters far and wide. You know, extending out to people like. Uh, Bray Wyatt, yeah, yeah, who has cited him as an inspiration. Uh, you know, so many people net who are wrestling now, you know, often cite him as an inspiration or someone that's helped them along the way. Mm. Uh, and, and by all means, like, um, if you're able to go out and find them, search up his like talks or stuff that he did for releasing his books. Yes. Oh um, yeah, yeah. That's actually a good point. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that. I'll mention that because uh, incredibly informative person. So yeah, such so a much so much knowledge. Such a well mm. of knowledge. Um, for me, I feel like he's the pure embodiment of the man who shouldn't have, but absolutely did. Yeah. Yeah. He's the pure embodiment of that term. Uh. Because, yeah, because if you look at his early career, as we talked about it, there was a man that was kind of really kind of told that he would never get to a point like being an absolute main event draw. But God, did he prove everyone wrong. And then some with everything he did in in his time in WWF. Now, just again, one of the very first wrestlers I saw when I started watching and a person who... I could never stop watching to this day. I, I will still, I still love watching five of these matches. Um, oh, no, such a good, such an incredible figure in the world of professional wrestling. I could go on forever, but I'm not going to, I'm going to leave the floor for Rid and to be the last thought on this one. First of all, real quick. Yeah. If you, if you want to learn more about wrestling in general and for the in particular, read his books. They are really good. They are really good. Like, really good. Cannot emphasize enough. New York Times bestseller. Yeah. That's how good he is. <laughs> yeah. Very smart dude. I... Yeah, he is the closest thing I could think of until arguably, the, until arguably like Edge and arguably The Miz of a wrestling Cinderella story. Yeah. Because Yeah, no, I can I can believe that. I can be, I, I absolutely yeah. get that. Because when you look at Mick Foley how he looks and how and even how he even how he wrestles, which isn't bad by any means, but he doesn't wrestle like flashy isn't the way I would call Mick Foley's wrestling. Mm. No, even, no, no, even, no, even for even for even for guys of his time even. Yeah. Mm. 
No, but, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't call his style flashy, but mm. I, again, I think the, one of the, the great powers of it is it doesn't have to be. Yeah. 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 And I think he shouldn't have done it, but he did through, through just sheer personality, ideas, charisma, and a superhuman intolerance to pain. Well, actually, no, no, actually. I will take that back because Mick Fo- that th- you know what that actually makes it even even more almost heroic for me because Mick Foley has said repeatedly he has no supernatural resistance to pain and he does not like it. I think that's what I think that's <laughs> yeah. I, if there, if there's ever a, something for me to leave off on personally, it's that everything you see Mick Foley does, he is just a human being who doesn't want to do it as much as you or I would want to do it, but he <laughs> does it anyway. And I think, I can't think of a more ringing endorsement for Mick Foley's career than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's fair to say, Mick, if you are listening to this, Dan, make sure to at real Mick Foley for this one. <laughs> I will. I will. We love Don't you. worry. We, we, we absolutely love you, dude. You're an absolute inspiration to every wrestling fan and every possibly every casual human being going. But gosh oh, darn, absolutely. Sir. Gosh darn, sir. You have earned your retirement. You have earned yeah. your rest and all of the plaudits you've been given. May you have a long, restful retirement, my man. Yes. <laughs> may Never the wood, come may the back. May you work with be paper and not tables. Exactly. Yeah. But Foley, we all... At the Sweet Chin Red Podcast, love you. Never get in a ring again. <laughs> Please pass the message on to Terry as well. Yeah. <laughs> Stop that man by any means necessary. <laughs> Forever. Anyway, that is how. Uh, <laughs> that is concludes this episode all about Mick Foley. A very, very poignant, very enjoyable episode. I, it was very enjoyable doing the research notes and watching all of these oh. matches. Uh, so so much fun on this one for sure next episode though man if we're talking about it's a some, doozy isn't it it is a doozy we, 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 we've been talking about an inspirational figure one of the, probably one of the most iconic wrestlers of all time haven't we in this episode but we're going to be talking about the most iconic wrestler the most influential inspirational decorated wrestler to ever step foot in a ring in a career spanning decades, they have picked up every heavyweight championship that they they have been in. They've picked up numerous titles and grand slams across the world. And for my money, if you ask me, the absolute greatest wrestler of all time, who that is, you're going to have to find out on the next episode. Leave your guesses. Leave on your Twitter. Guess. Yes, <laughs> please leave your guesses on Twitter. But, but go, go, sorry, it's, it's sorry. a doozy. I just have to say it's a doozy, and it's one I've been excited to talk about ever since this. This has been on the docket since this podcast was formed. Yeah. So this is, a, this is an important one for us. An absolute important one, for sure. But uh, until next time, I have been Sam. This has been Dan and Reardon, and you have been listening to the Sweet Chin Web Podcast. We will see you on the next one. Bye, everybody! Bye, bye! Bye, bye! <laughs>